Hello and welcome. If you are not here for the true cost of open source, you're in the wrong room. You need to use the exit, go down the hall and find the right presentation. Thank you for coming. If you are here to listen to me talk about the cost of open source, my name is Suzanne Ambiel, and I am with VMware. I'm our Director of Open Source Marketing and Strategy at VMware. And um, in, in the spirit of OSS love from this morning, I want to shout out some OSS love to a couple of people in the audience. Mr. Hecht from the Linux Foundation Research and from the Newstack, and Geeky Girl Dawn, Dr. Dawn Foster over there, my colleague at VMware. Open Source love to the both of you. Thank you. Um, let me get started. A little bit about me. Um, you can see my Twitter handle there, at Rosso Velo. That means red bike. I used to have a red bike. It got stolen, but I didn't change my tag. Um, I have been at VMware for 12 years now, and I've been in tech for quite some time. Uh, work at a company called Tandem Computers. Raise your hand if you know anything about that. Ooh, I know how old you are. Um, <laughs> and I also worked at Sun Microsystems. Anybody Sun Microsystems? How about Java? Yeah, remember Java days? Yeah. Um, so I've been around the block once or twice. Uh, my career started in broadcast news and public utility, making, uh, doing general rate case testimony for Pacific Gas and Electric. So I've had a very varied career. These are some of the things I enjoy in life, uh, outdoors, outside, on my bike. I have two dachshunds, Paradox, um, and that's me in the bottom right corner with my favorite gravel racer, Sarah Sturm. I have started to race bikes, and I have absolutely no business doing that because somebody's got to finish last, and that would be me. So you can see my Instagram uh, handle down there, Bike Snappy, if you're interested to see what I follow, which is bikes, beer, and dogs. OK, um, and with that, the agenda today, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about kind of our arrival, our being open source, we're arrival in the big time, how we got there, what it looks like, um, what are the implications of that. And then I'm going to go into a little bit of a problem I see kind of lurking in some of the data and some of the reports that I've seen published as of late from a variety of sources. And then we're going to go into a little bit to talk about some of the, maybe the, the causes of that. We're going to talk about some behavioral economics, and don't worry. It'll be fun, I promise. We're going to talk about demand and supply, or supply and demand. We're going to talk about the free rider and the tragedy of the commons, and that is not a Shakespeare play. Um, then we're going to talk about the consequences that are looming on the horizon because of this situation and what we should be thinking about and how we should be changing, and talk a little bit about the solution, and then give you a little bit about an opportunity for all of you to participate in how to solve the problem, and how to start understanding the problem a little more deeply. So that's what I'm going to cover today. And I know I'm between you and lunch, so I will try and use short words and finish early. Before I begin, I do have an econ degree, and so I need to make my apologies to Adam Smith, John Maynard Keynes, and Milton Freeman, and all my econ professors, because I am going to be taking liberties. And if for, all, for all of you who may have an econ degree, you may go, eh, it's not quite right. I'm like, well, okay, so I bent some of the rules to apply to the special circumstances that we are here in open source. So, and that is Adam Smith there in Edinburgh. So, um, one of the econ heroes. So as we get started, I want to just kind of set the stage and set some definitions that I'm going to be using for this presentation. I define price as the economic value assigned to an asset expressed in the form of currency and documented in the form of a transaction, a purchase order, right? A bill, an invoice. I'm going to define cost as something a little bit different. Cost is the combination of the price that you paid plus any indirect investments that you have to expend to put that asset into productive use. It's the price you pay and the cost you incur. That becomes the total, the total number. And then value is the benefit that you gain or receive by putting that asset into productive use, less any costs. Ideally, you want that number to be positive. Because if it's not, you're upside down. And you should question your motives for actually having that asset in production. So keep those definitions in mind. So today, we know that open source is preferred. Study after study has said that customers, buyers, users, 
they now prefer open source. It's become kind of the lingua franca of this modern apps and cloud world that we're all in the middle of. This study here, which was published by uh, O'Reilly Media, called The Value of Open Source in the Cloud Era. And you can look that up. You can go get that little book. It, one of the quotes I pulled out from it was that companies choosing multi-cloud prefer OSS because it meets their requirements. And that 70% of respondents prefer cloud providers that offer those solutions based on open source. So here's a declared preference. And at VMware, I work a lot with our sales teams. They are asking me now, what is this open source again? My customer's asking about it. What is it? How do I talk about it? So I know too from firsthand experience that customers are starting to express this preference. And we all know in the application world that open source isn't optional. It's a required ingredient of any application we build today. You can't build modern software without open source nor would you want to. That would be a, a sort of a, a silly endeavor to, to, to even try. A study by IDC showed that 72% uh, of all modern apps developed that they, that they scanned over that past year include externally sourced components. No surprise. And that external com components accounted for about 80% of the resulting code. So, tw so only 20% of an application is potentially net new code. The rest of it is reused. Some of that may be open source. Some of that may be inner source, where you're sharing proprietary code amongst applications. But the fact of the matter is, only 20% may be net new. Here's another study picked up, a uh, sponsor here, Synopsys. This is their 2022 so open source security and risk analysis report. And I thought this report was fascinating. And I pulled out this one page, this one slide, that, that showed the percentage of scanned code bases containing open source in the following industries. From computer hardware and semiconductors, that's that first red box there, all the way down to healthcare in the bottom corner there. But you'll note that every single number there is above 90%. So the percentage of those code bases in those industries that had open source is 93% or more. And of those code bases, 78% of the code was in fact open source. That's significant, right? And this is starting to become, you know, on the surface and people are paying attention to it. So let's sit back and give ourselves a big pat on the back. We did it. We be in the open source community. We've arrived. We now have a seat at the table. We all knew it all along, but now we're being acknowledged as, yeah, you're here. And as I, um, Brian Bellendorf said on Monday, uh, good enough for the CIA and the Vatican at the same time. Right? And I think he got that quote from somewhere else. I didn't write down the full uh, citation, but I thought that was a great line um, to, to kind of evidence where open source is today. We've all earned this place at the grown-up table. But we've also earned all the, all the benefits and consequences that that confers. We've been proven to be reliable, safe, secure mostly, but same with all software, trustworthy mostly, same with all software, no different. And for many that are now consumers and, and reliant on open source, it's free. Or is it? We're going to get into that in a minute. But in all of this celebration and all of this data that's affirming our place in this whole ecosystem, there's a small problem lurking. And I've started to notice it in a variety of studies. And let's take a look at what that's telling us. So here's my first foray into econ. This is supply and demand, econ 101. And what I've observed, and this is my own personal opinion, is an unbalanced situation that's starting to emerge. This is a question from the annual OSPO survey run by the To Do Group, uh, also sponsored by the Linux Foundation. This is from last year, 2021 data. data. So the question was, where is your company or organization on its open source journey? And you can see over the past three years, the consuming is quite high, but the supply, that is the contributing, is low. And so there's this divide here that's starting to emerge, and it, it seems to be consistent. It's not, it's not closing. And in some cases, it's widening. And you can see some interesting things happening in the data there, and I'm really curious to see what happens in 2022. 
because you know, there was this thing called a pandemic. So you know, I think that influenced a lot of the numbers that we're seeing, especially in this space. So, um, but, but there is this, this difference between what I consume and if I'm willing to contribute. Now, asking that question a different way, the survey also posed, how often does your company do the following things? How often do you use open source code for non-commercial or internal reasons? Use open source code for commercial products or contribute code upstream? And this is just from last year, 2021, so you can see frequently, sometimes, rarely, never, don't know. The never line is 27%. That's a lot. That's an astonishing number of people who say, we will never do that, have never done that. And yet, they frequently, you know, the frequent number is 62%, and on that frequent code upstream, only 20%. So again, there's this big gap between, I'm using it, I rely on it, I trust it, I have to have it, and oh no, I'm, I'm not going to participate. Mr. Rostet. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that 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 can be sorted out, right? And so um, uh, the the question in the audience is: Do do you segregate between companies that don't have developers and can only consume, and companies that have developers but don't choose to participate? for whatever reason. And yes, you can sort the data by this. I'll give you the link to the data. You can go in and rummage around in the GitHub repo yourself and, and kind of sort all, tease all that out. This is just kind of high level pick of, of the, the, the overall view of what's happening there. So, so there's a problem going on here. And so, you know, it's, I'm not trying to assert that for every get there's a give. There should, there's not necessarily a one-to-one, -one, if I get one thing, I'm going to give one thing. But there is this, this, uh, this notion that you should be uh, invested in open source if you are relying on it, and if it is an essential part of your code base. You should have some, um, some participation level. It shouldn't be rarely or never. So what's going on behind the scenes? And this is where I think there's some behavioral economics at play. So again, economic theory, some plausible things that are happening in the background. The first one I think we can all agree is something called the free rider syndrome. And in economic theory, the free rider syndrome is when something, a good, right, open source, is non-excludable, open to all. When it's available at no cost, i.e. free, there's no currency transaction. There's no barrier to access or entry. You don't have to show a credential or prove who you are or enter a gate. It's just there for you. It delivers value. In other words, it's something you want. It changes, it, it, it helps you to achieve a goal. And it lacks centralized management or control. Now, all of those qualities describe an open source ecosystem pretty well. A lot of people call the free rider syndrome the NPR challenge. National Public Radio, right? They raise money. They have their pledge calls. You know, call now and pledge $10 a month and get a tote bag. And there's a lot of free riders in NPR. There's a lot of free riders out in the open source ecosystem. The second thing that I think is happening or is a, it, it has actually occurred in some projects is the tragedy of the commons. And this is a sort of a self-centered notion in economic theory. This is where individuals with access to a public or common resource um, act solely in their self-interest for their own gain. They let others do the investment, and they just take. And they know they're doing it, and they're willful, and they do, that is their strategy, right? And as that happens, and as more and more people adopt that philosophy around this asset, the commons, or that asset, is swiftly overrun, destroyed, ruined, because too many people took too much with too little investment back in. Now, another example of this is a freeway and traffic congestion. If everybody decides that driving a car is the right way to go, and everybody does it by themselves, 
all of a sudden, that freeway no longer works. It's too congested. That's the tragedy of the commons. You have to start acting not in your self-interest for that common asset to retain any value. Now, the last thing that I would hypothesize is going on is a little bit of the paradox of price. And that's what happens when something has a price of free. It has, it, it automatically infers no value back to that individual because you haven't had to extract an economic cost from your, your situation. So you haven't had to make a trade-off. So every month you have a budget and you can buy this or that. And if you buy this expensive thing, you can't buy those other three things. You've had to make a trade-off. There's a consequence to your choice. Now, if something is free, there's no consequence to that choice. There's no budgetary impact. It becomes invisible because it doesn't have a resource commitment assigned to it. There's no line item in the budget. There's no purchase order or bill or invoice associated with your consumption. So the result is the consumer of that good tends to treat that good with a little bit of willful disregard. An analogy I have for this situation is a water meter. Okay? California's in the middle of an epic drought. Hundreds of years, it's never been this bad. I grew up in a town in Sacramento called Sacramento. And Sacramento were by two, the confluence of two rivers, the Sacramento River and the American River. And growing up, we used water as much as we wanted, whenever we wanted. Why? No water meter. No charge. No one was counting. So it didn't matter. And even today, there are no water meters in Sacramento. Doesn't matter. And so, of course, water consumption isn't being managed in Sacramento in the middle of a drought. So again, if you put a price tag on it, if you meter it, and all of a sudden you're aware of it, you start to understand your consumption of it, and you, you're better at managing it. Now, the last thing on the bottom of the slide is not an economic theory, but I'll just call it ignorance is bliss. Now, all those economic theories above assume foreknowledge. I know I'm a free rider. I know I'm part of the tragedy of the commons. And I know this thing I'm using and has no price. I know. The last one, ignorance is bliss, is I don't know and I don't want to find out. That is also, I think, happening quite a bit. So a lot of this thought was inspired by a blog I read a couple years ago by Dries Butart. Somebody help me with the last name. I know I butchered it. Um, this was written in September 19, 2019. It was called Balancing Makers and Takers to Scale and Sustain Open Source. And this is an extraordinary piece, very thoughtful writing. Um, he's not an economist by training, but there was a lot of clues into this. And um, uh, it is a long blog. Uh, set aside a half an hour or more to sit down and really go through this and read this. But it's really interesting. This one poll quote I really like, which is, the difference between makers and takers is not always 100% clear. Makers, as a rule of thumb, makers directly invest in growing both their business and the open source project, while as takers are focused solely on growing their business and let others take care of the open source. That is the classic free rider. So there's makers and takers, and not everybody can be a maker, Stephen Rostat. Some people cannot for whatever reason, but most can be a maker. Most can figure out some way to invest back. So the result of all this free rider tragedy of the commons, ignorance is bliss, and the, the paradox of, of price is, is this great illustration. Nobody says it better. I don't think there's a presentation without this, right? Like, there you go. You have this one little stick in the middle. Everybody's relying on it, and, that, and, and we're OK with that. Well, we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be OK. Um, and what happens when we do that, when we have this one little spike here? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the risks involved in that. And this is a hat tip to Don Foster. This is a, a, a lot of the next slides are from inspiration from her blogs, her writing, and her presentation that she's given at Open Source Summits in the past. And if you want to read more by Dr. Don Foster, you can see her blog link down there. Um, she's done a whole series on risk and open source and how to identify it and how to mitigate it. And some of these thoughts are from that. 
Some risks to consider are project ownership. If you're, look, if you're using open source, do you know real, who really owns that or controls that project? Is it an individual benevolent dictator for life or solo pilot? Or is it company owned controlled? Or is it foundation led and community managed? Each of those poses different levels of risk that you may or may not be comfortable with and may or may not have accounted for as a potential cost. For projects that don't have a lot of adopters, that should raise some alarms in your head. Um, the more adopters, the better. It lowers the risk because there's more people contributing to it that you can look to. Two more types of risk are security. Right? Lower risk projects have documented processes. So you know what happens, how people collaborate, lead, make decisions, how things get posted and remediated. And then a risk is also involved if you're too distant from that open source project and unaware and connected to it, technical debt starts to mount very, very quickly. And technical debt is one of the most expensive debts you can carry on your books, largely because you don't know it's there. And I have a sea turtle picture there because funnily, you know, it's only fun being underwater if you're a sea turtle. Um, other than that, it's not a whole lot of fun to have all that technical debt around your neck. And then ignorance is bliss. Recall that studies show that up to 80% of a code base could be open source. And if you don't know, is my code base 80%, 60%, 20%? If you just don't even know how much is open source and you don't know what open source there is, that's kind of an 80% gap, an 80% blind spot in the thing that you're building and shipping. And that should make you very, very nervous. So again, going back to price and cost and value and revisiting those definitions Price is that dollar amount you exchange to get that asset. Value is the benefit that you get from using that asset. And cost is the combination of the price that you pay and any indirect investments you have to make to get that productive use. And I will assert that cost is where surprises are likely to happen to change your value line from a positive to a negative. Right? And all of those risks that we talked about before are actually cost in disguise. So risk is cost in disguise. It's a future cost of unknown magnitude that must be paid, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, maybe in two months, maybe every single day for every single thing that you're building. But the point is, you don't know. If you don't know what you're using and you don't know its state, this is a huge problem for you. And I think this is where I see this supply and demand gap growing, where people are adopting open source and embracing it as you know, kind of the, the superpower for their code. But at the same time, these same companies aren't willing to contribute. And some of these same companies that are enthusiastically embracing open source are also enthusiastically prohibiting their employees from participating. And so there is some cognitive dissonance happening there. That we need to start thinking about and understand why a company would say, no way, never. But at the same time say, I will consume nothing but open source, right? There is some dissonance happening there that kind of need to look in the mirror at. So, how can OSPOs help resolve this difference? And I think OSPOs and you know, OSPO-like groups within companies or even individuals can really help to lean into this and identify this problem to management. You've got an 80% blind spot. Let's start talking about it. Let's start having some uncomfortable conver conversations maybe in certain circles about what you need to change and how you need to change. So the first thing I think an OSPO or an OSPO-like individual, they can start having some guided discussions or conversations with their leaders, which is all about open source. What, 
What are you using? Where are you using it? Do you have an inventory? Are you compliant with licenses? So this is a compliance starting point, and that's often the place where OSPOs start. Are you compliant with the licenses? Do you know, even know what you have? The ingredient list, the SBOM, right? The OSPO can then take that conversation to the next level, which is asking that question of why. Why that open source and not something else? Did you get here, here being the consumption of that open source by accident? You just don't know why. Is your open source consumption strategy ad hoc in the moment, built of accident and incident for 80% of your code base? Or did you arrive here by design with purposeful documented choices? And OSPO can help with that conversation and help lay out what those checklist items might be to make smarter, informed choices and to document them so that the next person down the road would go, ah, aha, you're using these things and here's why you chose to use things and why you chose to use those versions. When that's documented, now you know, now you can act on it. When it's not documented, where do you go? They can take the next step and say, okay, you, you, you have these things, you've decided to use them. How close are to source are you? How, how much of a snowflake do you really have? What is your technical debt on that piece of code? And how would you get to current? Is that even possible at this point, right? So they can help you have those technical discussions to figure out how to get yourself into better stead. And then for that product and that open source component, is it strategic? How do you know? And if it is strategic, what sort of commitments are you making to protect that investment? At VMware, Dawn's group maintains a list of strategically identified open source projects that VMware participates in. And we keep our eye on that list because those open source projects are very important to us and to our customers. And so we monitor those and we invest in those more heavily than we would others. But we've made a decision. Yes, that one is strategic and here's why. And we check in on that and we make sure that that project is healthy and thriving and has what it needs, whether it's something that VMware has originated or it's a third party project that we're participating in. But we keep our eye on that with intent because it is strategic and we're making commitments to it. The next thing an OSPO can do is help you check your contribution culture. What is the environment that you've established for your employees? Are you a prohibit, just say no? Are you an ignore culture, which is don't ask, don't tell, I just don't want to know? Are you a tolerate culture that says, Ugh, well, if you must, we'll make an exception just for you? Or are you a culture that expects and encourages open source participation? And you know, I'll, I'll say a little slide remark here, be careful what you wish for, because it could end up being one of your OKRs. I don't know if anybody has any OKRs going down, but. Um, so, so there's a whole spectrum, and it may not be evenly applied across a large organization. There may be some organizations that may be on the prohibit end, and others that may be on the expect and, and encourage end. But again, an open source program office can help establish a more positive contribution culture, one that's based, more than, based on more than just compliance. They can help guide you and give you um, tips and, and best practices on how to engage in an open source project, what type of contributions, right? All of these things can help your, your employees act with more confidence and competence as they step into an open source community that may be brand new to them. You know, a lot of people said lurking and stalking is the place to start. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll use the word spectate. It's great to go to a project and spectate first. Just listen and learn and watch and understand and then as you get more comfortable with it, then you can step in ever so gently as, as much as you want to start to engage. And I'll give you some tips on that in just a second. The to-do group has an immense 
immense treasure trove of information. For those of you who are curious how to start, what to do, there are, I'll call it guides galore on the to-do group site. How to create a program, measuring your program, tools for managing your program, how to use open source code wisely, community participation, the list goes on and on and on. It's all documented, it's all great content. You can see the guide there. For a lot of people, reading isn't the best way to get through something, so they also have training modules. So they've taken that content and made training modules out of it. Again, you can get that content for free on GitHub. You can go down, you can download each of the modules, and you can read through it yourself. But for many, that's not incentive enough. So sign up for a class. And then there's seven modules, and you're expected to finish each one and take a quiz. Sometimes that is the great motivator to get through some content. So there's a several module program. It's formal. It's on the Linux Foundation. There is a cost involved. So if you don't want to pay, again, cost, price, value, go to GitHub, and you can read it on your own. But you may not be a learner that learns by reading. You need to listen and see. So again, take advantage of all these resources if you don't have an open source program office today and realize that you might need one because of some of the situations I discussed earlier. And less formally than that, here's some other tips. If you are a consumer or user of open source, and every single one of you is in this room, step one, identify the open source that you deem essential or strategic to you yourself personally, to your, your project, to your team, to your department, to your company, and then go to the source. Is there a contributor's guide? Is there a governance doc? If there are, read it. Study what's happening. You know, be a spectator in that project. Understand what's going on. Understand where it's at, where you're at, what's the difference between the two. And then maybe, maybe on a big dare, introduce yourself. Say hello to the maintainer. Say, thank you. I'm using your software to do X. Let them know. Sometimes that can be just such payback for anybody who's worked so hard on a project to have someone say, please, thank you. And then step three, how can I help? What do you need? I'm using this. It's giving me great benefit. How can I repay that? How can I help you? Now, for those of you that are on the other side of the fence, you're a project maintainer or leader, I ask three things of you. One, update your contributor's guide and governance doc. Or if you don't have one, make one. Doesn't need to be elaborate, doesn't need to be fancy. There are plenty of templates out there for you to choose from. CNCF, CN, the CNCF has plenty of templates that you can look at and borrow from. I would also say code of conduct, also very important for your project so people understand how does this project work how do I go from spectate to contribute? Make it easy. Make it friendly. Ensure that you've got communication channels set up, that you have regular calls, that you have uh, frequently asked questions, things that help someone feel comfortable at home. I call it hospitality. Project hospitality. Make it a welcoming place. And then step three, be explicit. Ask for help. Here's my list of good first issues. Here are the things that I'm wrestling with. Here is my roadmap. Here's what I hope to achieve. Would you like to help? Sometimes that explicit ask for help gives that person that over there that is a spectator the, the courage to say, I know something about that. I wonder if I could help. And now all of a sudden you have that two-way exchange. And then you're starting to bridge that gap between the demand for open source and the supply of people actually contributing to it. And you start to bring these two more into equilibrium, another favorite economic term. So as you engage and as you raise awareness of the consumption and use and the essential nature of open source in your, in your personal life, in your company, in your department, in your business, you start to increase contribution. You start to define the investment levels that you need. Put a line item in your budget, open source. What are you going to assign to that? Are you going to assign resources? How much? Is it resources in relation to the amount that, this, that you are relying on this? Is there an imbalance there that you might need to fix? 
And as you do this, your benefits will rise because as you get more engaged in the open source you rely on, you get closer to source, you get closer to that influence and impact, you, the, 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 that flywheel of innovation starts to spin so much faster. And your costs, aka your risks, will start to fall as you get more engaged. So there's a win-win there, and it's good for everyone. It's good for you, it's good for the community, it's good for the project. So it's something uh, you should really take a second look at. So in closing, what is the true cost of open source software? And like go any good economist, I'm going to say it depends. It depends on a lot of things. Where are you at on your journey? How close are you to source? What is that open source project? How are you using it? But what I would say and I encourage to all of you is just take away three things. Don't be a free rider. Pay your dues. Call now. You might get a free tote bag. You don't know. But pay your dues. Ignorance is not bliss. It's going to bite you. Many people that endured the Log4Shell, Log4J situation were like, do we have it? I don't know. How do we know? I don't know how we know. That was a really big sort of pivotal moment for a lot of people. And so ignorance isn't bliss. It's actually quite frightening. And then I would encourage you to operate with intent, not accident. Have a strategy, have a plan, know the why behind the open source that you are using. I like this quote that came from Joe Bita. Joe Bita is now a free agent. Um, he is on his own after working at VMware for the past four years. But he said, open source is a growing force for any company that deals with software. And today, that's every company. And smart organizations turn open source from a source of stress, i.e., I don't know, ignorance is bliss state, to a competitive advantage, where they understand what they're using, they're investing it, they're give, delivering more value back to that open source community, and they're also reaping the, the rewards of that. So be a smart organization. And then last but not least, I'm going to encourage all of you to take a look at the new research study that was released today. Hillary Carty, Carter talked about that this morning. This is the 2022 OSPO survey. Um, this survey is in field now. Um, you can go to that link down there. You can read the press release. You can get the little button that says take survey now. I encourage you all to take that survey. The richer the data set, the better the outcomes, the better the insights that we gain every year from understanding how each of you view open source, how each of you are using an open source program office or something like it or not, right? It helps us understand where we are on this maturity and what progress we have in front of us. And then there's another study coming up, hasn't been announced yet, but it's uh, Dr. Henry Chesborough. He's a faculty director at um, UC Berkeley School of Business. Um, he's an economist. Uh, he's going to be doing a survey called the Under Understanding the Economic Value of Open Source, and that is coming soon. I've seen a draft of that survey. I know that he's working on that. I expect to see that out in the coming quarter. So if you see that come your way, please, I encourage you to also take that as we start to understand the real numbers behind the open source that we're using today. And with that, I went pretty quickly. Um, I want to thank you all for your attention and coming. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer it. I can no longer draw the Keynesian cross, though, so please don't ask me to. Thank you. Any questions? Sir. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Can you, use, can you identify any of the strategies or metrics you use to identify the, the open source projects that are important to VMware? Let's see, Dawn just left. Um, so Dawn uses, um, she's part of the Chaos Project. She uses Baturgia. She uses Augur. Um, we have our own um, sort of criteria that we have internally about different types of technology, like you know, Kubernetes is obviously important to us. We're obviously going to keep an eye on that and other sub-projects, but she does have metrics that she tracks, and we do pull that data um, every quarter, knowing that the data is 
good but incomplete, so it's, it's directional. It, it's, it's, you know, what I've learned that capturing data in this area, the closer you get to the data, the less reliable it becomes because there's a lot missing, right? So you kind of have to step back and go, directionally, it's looking like this. So she uses a variety of tools, but if you have some specific questions on the scripts that she, she, she uses and how she does it, I encourage you to read out, reach out to Geeky Girl Dawn. Mr. Hecht. How do, um, how do C-level executives talk about the value of innovation, and how do you talk to them about how open source, the value of innovation that's coming from open source? Okay, so the question in the audience, I'll get to you in just a second, is um, how do you capture and, and quantify the value of innovation and the value of innovation from open source? Did I get that correctly? Yeah. Um, it, it is a conversation. VMware's Open Source Program Office reports to our VP of Research and Innovation, so innovation is near and dear to his heart, and it's not a, a, a foreign conversation. It can be a hard conversation for some who are not accustomed to open source to say, well, wait a minute, you just invented this great thing and you're giving it away for free? Tell me again how that works. But it, this is all about you know, that, that flywheel of innovation and sharing that, that um, that initial spark so that things can grow that much faster. What you do as an individual software company is you provide that differentiated value on top of that core. That's how you have to have that discussion. It's a tricky one. It, it's one that has to happen again and again and again before they get it. It takes a while. Mr. Bork. Suzanne, great uh, session today. Congrats. Uh, just a friendly suggestion on that one slide. You talked about the spectrum of yep. you know, ignore, tolerate. Yep. And then you led to OKRs, I believe. Yeah. There's one additional stage if you want to really get radical and optimistic is incentivize. Yeah. And it would be great to get more organizations to actually not just expect it, but go the extra mile and recognize it in a meaningful way. And it's one of the fights I've had in my travels yeah. because there's uh, plenty of examples of companies that incent um, patent creation, intellectual property, Correct. Correct. and uh, hold it up on a ivory Correct. tower and applaud it. And at the same time, they're consuming the holy <clears throat> out of open source mm. and they barely put a toe in the incentivized pool. Uh, here, here, I incenting that, um, rewarding that, acknowledging open source contributions, I think is critical inside a large company. Um, I know that Google does that regularly. They have quarterly awards and acknowledgement they publish publicly on who, who, who has contributed. Um, we are still on that journey at VMware, right? Um, and, and all of that does take time as people understand that they really are standing on the shoulders of giants. Mr. Rostat, Hi. question. Yes, um, I'm on the, uh, the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board, or uh, AKA the TAB. We are working on a rating system for companies on how, we how well they support maintainers, open source maintainers. Wonderful. And that should be Tell published hopefully soon. Um, I don't want to say anything right now, but we're right now working on something. We're going to probably go to a few companies that are open source um, to make sure that you know, they don't say, hey, wait, we're not rated in this like Red Hat, so like they know. But uh, yeah, expect that to come out. And we're hoping that that could help incentivize, incentivize the um, uh, companies to reward maintainers a little right. better. Who, who doesn't want to get a good, good grade, right? Let's be more specific here. You're creating systems to rate other companies? It's the Technical Advisory Board, Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. We're coming up with like a rating system that we're going to say these are the qualifications of that puts you on a thing. It's going to be kind of a general stand, like a system, yeah, that basically says this is where each company is listed in their support for maintaining for maintainers of open source projects. We have a long ways to go to say thank you to maintainers. Um, yeah. You know, we saw that slide in the in the keynote today that showed what there were some. 100 projects with only 15 people, the, the Census 2 report is just a, is astonishing at how few people are maintaining such critical projects and how we need to really change, change the balance on that and really change this, this, this imbalance between the two. All right, I think I am at time. I don't see my, my time lady um, holding up a red, yes, here comes the red sign right now. 
stop it says. So with that, I will stop and say wish you all a good afternoon. And thank you for coming. I really appreciate your time.